Hey Google, set my timer for 15 minutes, please. Second timer for 15 minutes, and that's starting now. All right, that's the goal, guys. 15-minute video. Hello. My name's Jay Wilson. I'm a freelance consultant through my company, Onyx Reporting. Today, we're going to take a look at um, dealing with a dirty import where total rows are mixed in with detailed data. So this use case comes to us from the Domo user group. Um, if you're not aware, there's a Slack group where you can get answers in real time uh, from people spread around the world to your questions. And that's particularly useful because right now the Domo Dojo is being migrated over to a new platform and it's down right now. But there's still this community out there that can help you. So check for the links in the description if you want to get part of this. Anyway, so this user has this data set and he was struggling to import it into, into into Domo, and you know a lot of people try to help him. And I was like, dude, this this problem comes up a lot. Send me a sample of your uh, data, and I'll I'll build you a YouTube video. And that's me. Uh, and that's what I do is I, I try to help people um, in the dojo. So go find me. Here's the sample data set, and you can see right away why we're having problems, right? I've got individual transactions, but then I've also got these headers kind of coming in here and mucking it all up during the import process. So today we're going to take a look at how you can um, build an ETL that gracefully handles this kind of problem. We're also going to take some a, a look at some of the new features in Magic ETL 2.0. And I think that's that's I mean that's plenty for 15 minutes, so let's do it. All right, so the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to upload that data into Domo. In Magic ETL 2.0, by the way, Magic 2.0 is still labeled a beta feature. So if you don't have access to it, talk to your CSM or um, uh, talk to your account representative. Tell them, <laughs> tell them Jay Wilson sent you and that you want to have access to Magic 2.0. <laughs> I wonder what that'll do. Anyway, so the date column. It's getting imported to Domo as text because I have text in that column, but in Magic, I can set an explicit date, uh, data type and say, I want you to convert my data to date. Now, you can set the date format year, month, day, month, day, year. I appreciate that Domo has this clever date parsing. I don't know what clever means or how it interprets the thing, but what's useful is if Domo is unable to um, convert your data to the data type you ask it to, you can tell it what to do with bad values. So in this case, I can tell it, hey, I want you to replace the value with a null, which is what we're going to do. Now, dear Domo, um, if you're watching this video, while replacing a value with a null is kind of a useful trick, what would be even better is if I could separate the streams of good data versus bad data. Because if I replace a value with a null, I can't see why the import process broke. So, dear Domo, if you could fix that, that would be amazing. Let's take a look at what my data set looks like once I have this in place. So here I've added a filter that will filter cases where the date is not null. And I can see in my preview, hey, this column has been converted into type date, and I've got some reasonable data coming in. And these, of course, are the transactions. Very cool. Here are the cases where the date is null. And let's ignore this filter for a sec, because we haven't talked about it yet. So in cases where Domo was unable to parse the column as a date, it replaced it with null. And in Domo, again, this is what I'm talking about. I don't know why this broke because it has been replaced with a null. So having access to the original value, the original column, might be a value, valuable thing to add back in. Anyway, for our use case, though, I can see right away, you know, it doesn't matter because... In my raw data, there weren't any dates here anyway, so I'm fine with it being a null. But what's also interesting is I have this header, which has the account name, as well as these two empty rows that I'm not interested in. I guess what would be super cool, coming back to my transactions, what would be cool and necessary is to figure out how I can get each account name associated with that transaction. I can tell just by looking at it, these two transactions belong to account number one. 
this set of transactions belongs to account number two. And way down here is the next set of transactions belonging to account number three. How am I going to do that? Most of the times when you're trying to figure out how do I logic through something, I, I recommend people just say how you would do it if you were explaining it to a child in plain English. In our case, if I asked you, how do you know these transactions belong to this account? You might say, well, all of the transactions between this account and the next account belong with the preceding account. Yeah? So basically, if I look at my headers and take all of the activity between the headers, let's assume that those belong together. So let's go to my data. Let's look at my headers and see what we can do. Um, that's good, actually. I've got my headers. Let me ignore the rows that have these totals for period and act. So basically, I'm going to filter out cases where the source is null. Sorry, I want to retain rows where source is not null. How are we doing? OK, so I got rid of the extra stuff. Now, the next thing is I want to identify all of the transactions between here and there. How am I going to identify the transactions? Well, I need to, well, first identify, I need to ID each row of my data set. To create a row ID, I'm going to use the row number um, window function. And in order to create a row number, I have to define an explicit sort order for my data. Now, resist the temptation to sort by date, right? Because think about it. I could have activity belonging to 20, 30, 40 different accounts on January 1st. And again, in January 2nd, I could have 20, 30, 40 activity belonging to on the date of January 2nd. So I don't want to sort by date. I actually don't want to change the sort order of my data at all. I don't want to change the order. So what I'll do is I'm going to add a constant um, that's just the integer, just the value, the number 1. And that's what I'm going to use for my sort order. Cheeky. <laughs> I'm also not going to set a um, partition. So at the end of this data flow now, or sorry, at the end of this stage, which is occurring pre-filtering, I have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 as the row ID of my report. Coming over to my headers now, I can see OK. I've got the row ID. Now, if I asked you which transactions belong to header number one, you'd say, oh, the transactions that belong to header number one are obviously all of the transactions between one and five. And I'd ask you, well, how do you know? You'd say, well, what I did is I went to the next row. I got the row ID of the next row, and I subtract 1. To do that in magic, we're going to use a window function. We're going to use the lead function. So I'm going to create a column called next ID, and I'm going to ask it to get me the lead, the next row ID, where the offset is 1, the next row. Yeah, easy. Then, again, I need to apply an explicit sort order. So I'm going to order by the row ID ascending. Again, no partition. The output of this is going to be I have a new column, and 6, 6, 242, 242, 385, 385. This makes sense. But I don't want to include row 6 twice, so I want to do 6 minus 1, because those are the transactions, 1 through 5, that belong with this account. And the transactions that belong with this account are all of the transactions between 6 and the next one, 242, minus 1. So this needs to be 241. 
To do that math, I'm going to use a new tile in Magic 2.0 called the Formula Tile. If y'all are new to my channel, this is my absolute favorite tile in Magic 2.0, and this alone is the reason why you need to get Domo uh, to en enable the Magic 2.0 beta in your instance. You can write formulas right there. And by formulas, I mean the editor actually looks like beast modes. This is actually the top complaint, right? This is the top complaint of real SQL developers who are forced to use Domo. Forced to use Domo like it's a bad thing. <laughs> This is their number one complaint. Is they're like Magic 2.0 or Magic ETL takes too many steps. But we can get rid of that argument as we start using the formula tile. So I can do next ID minus one. But oh hey, this is even cooler. I can do an in place transformation. I can overwrite an existing column right there um, using this uh, add formula tile. Um, once I know the span of rows, one to five, I'm also going to calculate how many rows or how many transactions does my header represent. And to get that, I'm going to take the number of um, the end row minus the begin row, which is the row ID. In other words, I'm going to say one. My uh, this account spans rows one through five, which is a total of four rows. Five minus one is four. Similarly, this spans um, six through 241. 241 minus six is 235. Very, very cool. Do you want to see the equivalent in Magic 1.0? Oh my god, this is terrible. Here we go. Um, what I would have had to do, I would have had to make a calculator. I would have had to use a calculator tile in order to create a new column where I do my subtraction. And my subtraction was going to be next ID minus a specific value of 1. But because I can't do an in-place transformation, I would have had to do a select here. And then I would have said, oh, yeah, do that, but drop the old next ID and then replace my new column as next ID. So many steps. I totally get the old school SQL developers who are like, man, this UI, it, 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 it's too much work. Um, but I'm really appreciating the effort Domo has made to understand how real people built data flows and to make this a better user experience. So Magic 2.0, get in there. Wicked. Now, here's where things go sideways. What I want to do is I want to say, hey, take this header and join it to my transactions. Now, I want to join it to these tr two transactions because they have the row ID of 2 and 3. And 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 belong to the next account. I need to do a join on a between clause. That's normal SQL, right? I need to join on a between clause. Unfortunately, Magic ETL does not support join on a between clause yet. I'm going to show you guys a workaround, but again, Domo, if you're watching, I want you to appreciate my pain and mental gymnastics we have to go through to implement a join on a between clause, which is a very common requirement. I figure if I needle them a little bit, it might lead to change in the product. Who knows? All right, so I have this data set called a one to many. Um, if you're new to the channel, um, Maybe subscribe, because I've covered this content before. And if you're old to the channel, you're like, yeah, we've seen this, Jay, a million times. But here we go. Um, so I have this data set called one to many. And basically what it does is um, for a column that contains a value 3, I duplicate the row four times and then do a countdown. 3, 2, 1, 0. Similarly, if I have, like, I need to duplicate the row five times, I have 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So I do this countdown thing. Why do I need this table? Well, coming back to my header, I need to join this row to my transactions, right? But I can't join on my transaction ID is between 1 and 5. So what I can do is I can duplicate this row four times. And then I can say, oh, that's row 1, 0, sorry, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 
<laughs> plus one is three, right? So I can basically duplicate this row n times and use that countdown from the other table to calculate the matching row ID. And we're definitely going to need it here because I need to duplicate this row 235 times and the row ID needs to span 235 um, plus six through 241. That's been 15 minutes. Oh, shoot. I'm not even done with my tutorial. Hey, Google, stop. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up quickly. So here we go. So I do my join on the join column. I can drop the join column because I no longer need it and will duplicate my row, my headers many, many times. I'll add a formula tile that says, hey, take the row ID, which is the start start row number and then add my countdown one two three four five and that's going to be called join id um, and then once that's done the only columns that i'm interested in are the account name and the join id so this value um, and then the join id this row will have been duplicated five times or ten times whatever but then the join id column will increment by one because i did that join to this one to many table. I can then join it to my um, transactions. And what I'll end up with is here are the individual transactions, all the information about the transactions. And then I've got in my account header. This has been joined in because I've duplicated that row n times and I have a matching join ID for each row ID. Domo, please. This is how much work you have to do and like mental gymnastics you have to do to do a join on a between clause. Um, but for everyone else, I hope you found this useful. Um, I'm trying to get you guys to the point where you don't have to default to using magic, uh, MySQL or Redshift to build these data flows because Domo Magic 2.0 is so much faster and so good. Um, I hope you like what you saw. I hope you find it valuable. My name is Jay Wilson. I'm a freelance consultant through my company, Onyx Reporting. I, I exist. Uh, I exist to help out people in the Domo community and help them move forward with the problems and challenges that they run into. So find me in the Domo Dojo. Um, find us in the Domo user group. I'll put a link um, in the description. I'll catch you guys later.